But if I had to choose between freedom and maybe dying early, maybe even dying horribly, and literal torture with no escape, hmm, gee, tough choice. Exposed. Veganism is worse for the planet. This is a Steven Crowder, Louder with Crowder video put out about a week ago. I think it has like a million views right now. I'm going to be responding to most of the video, including a lot of clips. There are some jokes, quote unquote, j that are just like bigoted and kind of nasty that I'm that won't be in this video, which is kind of amazing. I mean, he manages to include three bigoted jokes in like a 12 minute video. And one of which is in the cold open. So it's like the first few seconds of the video. <laughs> Super classy. Also, I'm going to say Crowder a lot just, you know, when talking about what's in the video. Obviously, I know that it's not just Crowder. There's a whole, you know, production involved. There are a lot of people involved in making these videos. You know, I'm sure he's not the one editing the videos or putting in the sources or anything like that. I wouldn't even be surprised if he wasn't the one writing the material, right? Uh, but just for brevity's sake, Crowder. Veganism, this is something you don't hear a lot, uh -oh. is potentially much worse for the planet. <gasps> no. Let me cycle mm, through this. Okay, uh, yes. Reason one, sustainability. A lot of people, I talked about this with uh, Lear Keith a long time ago. Mm. Topsoil erosion. Yeah. Uh, omnivorous farming is, is actually a lot more sustainable than the vegan model. So right. globally, we have, I want to make sure I get this right, 25 to 40 billion tons of topsoil are lost every year to erosion mainly due to plowing, intense cropping. Yeah. Topsoil erosion is caused by certain practices like tilling. Best practice in farming is no-till farming. This is actually much more applicable to meat, to most meat consumption, the vast majority of which comes from factory farms. However, if you are complaining about crop production generally, the majority of modern crop production is actually moving toward conservation tillage and no-till practices. This was really shocking to me, honestly, obviously in a good way. It's pretty awesome. And it makes what Crowder's doing here even more ridiculous right? Comparing crops grown via intensive tilling, which again, apparently is kind of falling out of fashion, out of practice, comparing that with like pasture raised meat or even hunted meat, which is a tiny fraction of meat that's actually consumed of meat that is produced is totally dishonest. And good practices for producing grains and vegetables can improve soil, which is actually stated in the FAO article he quotes that's in the video, because of course. The article also makes clear that clearing land for livestock, for grazing livestock, is a major cause of erosion. You can say that these are cases of bad management, and that might be true, but it's interesting that Crowder's default, his assumption of the default when it comes to meat, is nothing but charitable, right? It's hunted meat, it's pasture raised meat. But then when it comes to crops, it's the worst possible scenario. Scenario. It's just over tilling and soil erosion. He continues on with soil erosion and shares this little headline about UK soils depleting and only having a hundred harvests left. Yeah, no. This is one of many examples of just bad, <laughs> just bad research, quote unquote, right? Just reading a headline, even reading an article and just sticking it in there and not going any further, not looking for any sort of critiques or rebuttals, refutations, because the original thing supports the Crowder narrative, right? The Crowder narrative that veganism is bad and is worse for the planet. Awesome. Love this dude. <laughs> so the way to combat this, the top solar, is just letting the land just letting it return to being grazed Let pasture be. for a period and that re results in complete halting of the erosion and it rebuilds the soil. He cites this opinion piece in The Guardian. This is something I've talked about before. It's Alan Savory, holistic management nonsense. You know, the guy who once said, you'll find the scientific method never discovers anything. Observant, creative people make discoveries, but the scientific method protects us from cranks like me. Obviously, he didn't mean that in the way that it's worded, but 100% the scientific method does protect us from cranks like you. And then there's this and something that he wrote uh, in like a holistic management sort of uh, pamphlet. Holistic management does not permit replication. Every study of holistic plant grazing that has been done has provided results that are rejected by range scientists because there was no replication. Hmm. I wonder why he'd say such a thing. Oh. Oh. Right. But even if holistic management were as amazing as Savory says it is, it still requires more land than your conventional 
farming practices than your conventional livestock growing in feedlots, it requires more land. So even if we use this system, meat eaters would have to eat less meat. Yeah, like and there, there have been quite a few studies that show vegan diets are less sustainable, by the way, than uh, omnivorous diets in the long term. Here's yeah. a collage for you. Quite a few studies, and yet he only references one. It's that carrying capacity study from a few years ago. I talked about it here. They basically favored vegetarian diets over vegan ones by assuming that much of the land used to feed cows would just be abandoned. So there are a few problems with this. Number one, we already produce enough grains to feed everybody if we just stop feeding them to animals. We don't need that extra land, we don't need to produce as much food as possible, we just need to feed the population and we can already do that. Saying that a vegetarian diet is the best for the world because of carrying capacity, it's like saying that a school bus is the best vehicle for a family of five because of carrying capacity. Second, there's no reason to believe that we couldn't use land that's currently growing fodder or used for grazing to grow other crops. And number three, these studies talk about land footprint, but they completely ignore global warming potential. So another reason that veganism might be worse for the environment, people don't think about this, uh, it's often overlooked, the importation of foods. Yeah. Vegans are not advocating an apples only if you live in the Northeast diet while Floridians and Californians enjoy the cornucopia of a year yeah. round yeah. growing season. The yeah, point is they want a varied diet and it requires a lot of food like quinoa, oh. avocados, yeah. they'd be imported. <laughs> often from countries that don't have the same regulations or sustainable oh, farming none. practices no regulations. that you have in Grand Rapids, Michigan. <laughs> it's so bad now that countries like Mexico, Kenya, they've completely depleted their supply of wow. certain foods. So first, the local war claim. That's mostly a myth because the vast majority of embodied energy in a food is in the production of the food, right? It's not in the transportation or the distribution of the food. Second, Crowder is assuming that vegans are the ones driving sales of foods like quinoa and avocado, that we are the ones causing these shortages in Kenya and Mexico. Is At least that's what it seems like by putting these headlines in here. It seems like that's what he's implying evidence? I find it pretty hard to believe. Number one, these headlines do not support that claim. They have nothing to do with veganism. They only have to do with higher demand, which is coming in part from the US and other like Western countries where veganism is growing. But there is no indication that the majority of people in the US, in Australia, in the UK, who are buying quinoa and avocados are vegan. That would be pretty amazing given how small our population is. And most vegan staples are still like grains and legumes. And this is what most meat replacements are made of. And just a little side note, I mean, I don't, it's not that important, but talking about these headlines, talking about Kenya and Mexico, the ban in Kenya was lifted months ago. This article is from early last year, why he chose an older article. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I wonder why. There are now more stringent in requirements in place though for growers because part of the problem was to meet the higher demand, growers were shipping uh, fruits that were not ripe enough, right? They were premature fruits. And also earlier this year, I think in April, Kenya agreed to a deal with China that they would ship 40% of their avocados to China. And very few avocados imported to the US are coming from Kenya. The vast majority are coming from Mexico and then Peru, and then I think like Colombia. And the Mexico article also old, it's from 2017. As The Guardian helpfully points out, they have this little yellow box that says like, hey, this article is a little bit old. That's pretty cool. You, you probably should have checked that out, guys, but but okay. Anyway, uh, today Mexico seems to be doing pretty well when it comes to avocado exports. And if Crowder is really so concerned about avocado and avocado shortages, why not mention the greatest threat to the fruit right now? Oh, right. And even if vegans were eating that many avocados and quinoa, if we really were responsible for driving demand of avocados and quinoa, it's just not true that this is harmful to local populations. This is a common thing that's still said, even though it's, it was debunked like years ago. I have a whole video on it if you're interested. And I talk about quote unquote blood avocados or blood guacamole here. Anyway, back to Crowder's claims. He uses this quote from an almost 20 year old article and puts it over an image of avocados when the article never mentions avocados. I don't know, that might be misleading. What the article does say is that desertification is caused mainly by overlogging, over farming, and overgrazing. 
In other words, it's a mix of activities and grazing and producing feed for animals plays a huge role. In Latin America in particular, most of the deforested land ended up as pasture used to raise cattle in extensive grazing systems. Converting cleared forest lands to pasture frequently compounds the damage. Compounds the damage, right? So it's it's not healing it. It's making it worse. Nobody seems worried about avocados causing deserts. We're talking about deep-rooted permaculture. There is some concern about them replacing like old growth forests, but the reality is that replacing economically non-productive trees with economically productive cash crop trees is probably a pretty effective way to prevent deforestation and ultimately desertification. One forest being replaced by an avocado forest without being burnt down and bringing income into a poor region versus another forest being turned into a pasture and ultimately degraded into a desert. Gee, it's so tough to decide which is worse. What do you think is better for the environment? Eating venison from a deer you bagged yourself or eating meat from your local yak farm, for all I know. Or <laughs> fixing yourself $20 toast with avocados that were grown in Mexican tap water and tossed into trucks to t travel 2,500 miles. Yeah, yeah. Again, this is not an honest comparison because this is not the meat that most meat eaters are eating. And most vegans are not replacing meat with avocado toast. And even if we were, the avocado toast is probably better. Ruminant emissions are extraordinary, most of it being from enteric fermentation. It's not something that changes that much based on farming practices, or even if you're eating hunted meat. This article goes into all of the reasons why avocados have so much higher a carbon footprint than other fruits. And even still, it concludes that meat has the largest environmental footprint. I'm sure that you could construct a vegan diet that is worse in terms of sustainability than a meat eater, than an omnivore diet. A diet based on on like low yield fruits versus a diet of rope grown oysters and like insects. But it's irrelevant. Meat eaters are not living on crickets and oysters and vegans are not living on like watermelon. I mean, most of us aren't. <laughs> if you're looking for a way to make veganism less environmentally friendly, this is the way to do it. That's Reason rude. number three. <laughs> Carbon emissions. A lot of people don't uh, consider that farming land for crops releases more carbon from their soil than the land Oops. left for grazing. Land use changes the equilibrium of carbon in the soil, but it's not an ongoing thing. Badly managed cropland releases some carbon when it is converted from other land like forest or grassland, but then it stabilizes at that lower level. Even the quote Crowder highlighted mentions overgrazing, so it's really hard to see how he thinks this is a vegan issue other than just he wants it to be a vegan issue and he doesn't really care if the sources support that claim or not he just wants you to look and go "Ooh, he he's got things here that's a headline that's an article maybe they're referencing a study oh he must be right he's smart as to the point he's trying to make i don't understand why people making this claim don't understand the difference between a short-term carbon release with a limit and an ongoing source. This study explains the issue pretty well. A short period of soil sequestration at the beginning of a land use change does not make up for the methane production over time. It's like thinking that taking out a high interest loan is a good idea because you'll be rich. And you'll have no problem making those payments once you have all that money. Coming back to the issue, land managed better increases the amount of carbon in the soil, trapping it for a few years, and then again, stabilizing. It's something that we should consider doing to take some of the CO2 out of the atmosphere because it does add up, but this is something that applies to all farming practices, whether you're talking about grazing or you're talking about like cultivating grains. And this isn't something that benefits animal agriculture today, most of which is not based on grazing. Even ideal grazing doesn't get high marks for sequestration because more food per acre can be produced via plants. Meaning in a vegan world, we could convert a lot of unneeded farmland to forestry and couple that with best practices for the crops that we grow, potentially catch much more carbon than grazing ever could. Again, even the source that Crowder references mentions the impact of forests as carbon stores. Well, we talked about this last week, the uh, yeah. cotton bags, organic cotton oh, bags. Yeah. You'd have to use that cotton bag 20,000 times to break even <laughs> Good luck. with a plastic bag environment. That means that if you went grocery shopping, 
for over about 380 years we did the math <laughs> so this one is a bit off topic but it's it's also wrong and so i just, <laughs> I, i'm not gonna say anything about it i'll just share this little bit you can read it or not but yeah it's wrong the moral of the story here for anybody is don't just run with a headline, you know, actually look at the numbers, actually look at the data. If you can, if you have the expertise to do so, if you don't wait for someone else to do it for you, I promise you anytime something like this comes out, there very likely will be a rebuttal probably pretty soon. So just wait, right? You can be indifferent for some amount of time for forever if you need to, right? You don't have to have a decision on every little thing. And certainly if a headline like this comes out, and it says something that you really like, don't just jump on it. And this goes for the Crowder anti-vegan environmentalist crowd and their bias, right? But it also goes for vegans too. Don't just jump on a headline because it says vegan is the best thing ever. Do it now, right? Wait and follow up if you can. We can do better is what I'm saying. We're better than Crowder and these type of people, right? You know, obviously this video isn't for Crowder. I'm not speaking to someone who's making who knows how much money, you know, lying to people and ultimately saying, I don't like change and I want things to stay the way they are because I'm very privileged and things benefit me right now. Lucky me. I'm not trying to reach someone like that. I'm trying to reach other people who may be convinced by what he says because he speaks pretty well, speaks very confidently, speaks very fast, right? That has an effect on people, unfortunately. And he says that he's like a logic guy and a facts over feelings guy. And so it must be true. Anyone who says that, be skeptical. Be very skeptical because no one is facts over feels. We all have areas, uh, we all have biases, right? We all have blinders on when it comes to certain topics, some of us more than others, but we all have it. And if you don't recognize that about yourself, you can't be trusted because you're basically telling me that you think you're right about everything because you don't have any biases. You can just look at the, the data or the research or whatever and come to the right conclusion. Way too full of yourself. I don't know where I'm going with that. Moving on. Uh, another reason, I think that's number reasonable. four. Uh, this is something you were just talking about. The animals actually killed to yeah. protect and to create these crop yields. Yeah, it's a thing. A lot of vegans may not realize this. Do you know how it's 20, especially certain uh, grains like wheat. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's corn. I think we have a source. Mm -hmm. Results in 25 times more sentient animals wow. being killed per kilogram of usable protein. There's more environmental damage. There's more animal that's cruelty insane. than farming red meat. If you're vegan, you're probably rolling your eyes at this point. I'm sure you have heard this many times before. Meat eaters love to use this as a sort of gotcha, exactly what Crowder is doing in this video. First, this pretty much only applied to Australia, a specific crop grown in a specific region of Australia at a specific time of year, which is an outlier in the world in terms of mouse plagues. In most of the rest of the world, for the vast majority of vegan stable crops, this simply is not an issue. Second, this article is eight years old. Modern technology is helping farmers and the government track mice populations and get ahead of mouse plagues before they cause damage. The last big one was in 2011, which is when the article was published, 2011. Hopefully we won't see any more like huge mouse plagues, but climate change probably isn't doing us a whole lot of favors there. Again, if Crowder really cares about mice and mice plagues, yada, yada, yada. Third, even if this was a contemporary problem and was actually applicable to the rest of the world, the numbers are drastically wrong by a factor of 10 because of how the author misinterpreted the prevalence and extent of mouse plagues. He assumed that in the span of four years, the entirety of planted grain on average experiences mouse plagues. In reality, mouse plagues affected between 100,000 and 500,000 hectares of grain crops a year. That is quite a bit, but at the highest, it's less than 1 40th of the 22 million hectares planted annually in Australia. So every four years, that is one tenth right? The article is off by a factor of 10. We're talking about 2.5 deaths at most, not 25. Finally, the article fixates on mice, but it ignores all of the other animals that are killed to protect grazing lands, the animals that are killed to produce food that is fed to grazing animals. The same study that breaks down the mouse plagues goes into the issue of rabbits in Australia, which cost animal agriculture far more than cropland. There's no reason whatsoever to believe that fewer animals are killed for beef, even just in Australia, even when mouse plagues are at their worst. The other quote Crowder shares make similar errors, some of them the same ones, probably from the same source. 
But let's say that going vegan did somehow kill more like mice and birds than just eating a standard omnivorous diet. Is this actually comparable? In terms of lives lived, is it fair to compare the life of a mouse who died tragically but lived free to a chicken who died tragically after living tragically, after living its entire life in confinement? I'm not implying that wild animal suffering doesn't matter. It does, and often they die terribly, whether because of harvesting or just from starvation or infection or being eaten alive. But if I had to choose between freedom and maybe dying early, maybe even dying horribly, and literal torture with no escape, hmm, gee, tough choice. Do wild animals die to produce vegan food? Yes, of course. Should we strive to reduce that number, the number of deaths? Yes, of course. But we have billions of animals living every moment of their lives in confinement, in extreme physical and mental anguish. I'm pretty sure they're the priority. This neo-environmentalism and veganism, it's, it's not that it's pro-animal. We all love animals. It's anti-human. Yeah. And by the way, this is the, these are the same people. A lot of people don't understand this. These are the same people who lobbied and created the trans fat epidemic in this country. So for example, oh, wow. McDonald's, they used to use tallow for fries after lobbying from vegetarians to the USDA. They switched to hydrogenated vegetable oils because it was healthier, mm. right? A lot of people don't, it started off with the agenda though that they wanted to get more Americans on a vegetarian diet. I don't even know where to start with this. Vegetarian lobby, okay. Look, the reasons that trans fats became so ubiquitous, cheap, convenient, delicious. And also you had health organizations like the American Heart Association promoting them as a replacement for things like butter as a way to cut down on saturated fat. What that has to do with vegetarianism, I mean, maybe he thinks the AHA is run by vegetarians. Fuck, I wish we had that kind of power. Obviously, vegetarians would be very pro this news, at least originally, right? When everyone thought that this was a good move. Obviously, this is something that we would be for, not just from a health standpoint, but also from an environment and animal welfare standpoint, right? Moving from an animal product to a plant product, obviously. But do you see a bunch of vegans now promoting trans fat? No, we're all saying don't eat that shit. It's bad for you. So if his whole theory were true, that this is why vegetarians were trans, pro-trans fat and like this kind of underlying, like, oh, we don't care about human health. We're, we're just for animals, right? He even says that we're anti-human. Then I don't think you would see vegans and vegetarians today being pro-banning trans fats and telling people not to eat trans fats, even though that's that's clearly what we're doing. So... I don't know, maybe we're not actually anti-human. Maybe the vegetarian lobby had nothing to do with this. Just a thought. Anyway, he does have some evidence. It comes in the form of three headlines, which of course don't at all support what he says. This one makes a bunch of generalizations about vegetable oils failing to differentiate between healthier omega-3 rich oils like canola from, you know, sometimes less healthy options like corn and soybean oils. The second article, what does this have to do with the vegetarian lobby? The article itself is clear that perception of health benefit is from lower saturated fat which would be valid, but of course these oils don't necessarily contain less because they are hydrogenated. As to the last quote, CSPI is not a vegetarian organization, much less a vegan one. It's interesting that they still have that up as like a victory, given that they've been pushing against trans fats since at least the early 2000s. There's no reason to believe that it was any sort of like vegetarian ideology motivating any of this though, and not one of these articles even mentions vegetarianism. I want to go back to what he said at the beginning of that last clip. This neo-environmentalism and veganism, it's, it's not that it's pro-animal. We all love animals. It's anti-human. Yeah. I, I don't think the content supports that, at least in his case. I don't think this comes from someone who loves animals. The entire video, he's presenting the laziest of evidence in an attempt to dissuade people from killing less animals. He's making fun of those of us who are trying to encourage people to kill less animals. He's touting conspiracy theories about those people, about vegans and an attempt to like make them seem dishonest and shady. He's calling us anti-human. I get that he doesn't like vegans. I get that he has convinced himself that we are really anti-human. And look, there, there's some, uh, you know, misanthropy that goes on in veganism, but certainly not all vegans are like that. The vast majority of us are not like that, but that shouldn't even matter. If he really loved animals, 
whether or not vegans are good people should not matter one iota. If you really loved animals and you saw even a modicum of what goes on in a factory farm, your first reaction should be, oh my God, that's terrible. How do we keep that from happening? Is it possible? Let's say you know nothing about nutrition. Your first thought should be, hey, is it possible that we don't need to do this? Is it possible that we don't need to eat meat and drink milk to be healthy? You would try to find a solution. You would try to find a way to keep such an obviously wrong, evil thing from happening if you truly loved animals. You wouldn't make a video about veganism being bad, actually. You wouldn't make a video encouraging people not to eat less animals and making this a liberal leftist thing. That's not what someone who loves animals does. And I'm not saying that every person who isn't vegan hates animals and wants to eat them. Ha 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 ha. I'm not saying that. We're complicated. Human psychology is complicated. Food is delicious. Animal products are delicious. It's hard to stop eating it. But there is a difference between your average person who is just living their life and trying to do their best, the best they can, and someone like Crowder who is going out of his way to encourage people to continue doing this obviously evil thing. To me, that is not someone who loves animals. That is someone who loves being right. And that is someone who cannot handle cognitive dissonance. And it's someone who cannot handle change. None of this is to say that we can't be smarter <laughs> the uh, in our approach or the compromises. And, you know, I don't know. I've seen these commercials for insect protein on podcasts. Uh, I don't know exactly. Uh, 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 I don't what? know. How but is this Joe Rogan? you know what? Okay, here's a good, like goats use far less land than cattle. Okay. So that's something that's just kind of a cultural deal. We don't use goats as much. Okay. There are little solutions like this. Yes, it's true that you don't have to go vegan to make a difference. There are a lot of steps in between that make a huge difference. And there is diminishing returns, right? At least when we're talking about the environment, um, there's not a whole lot of a difference between here and here, right? If you're eating a plant-based diet and only having animal products a couple times a week, particularly certain kinds of animal products that um, have less of a carbon footprint, then yeah, there's not going to be a big difference between there and there, right? The biggest difference is happening along here. This is very scientific, as you can see. But yeah, there's going to be a big difference between a vegan diet and someone who's eating meat five times a day. There's not going to be much of a difference between a vegan diet and someone who's eating meat once a week or once a month. And, you know, the insect thing, yeah, sure, there's good reason to believe that insect protein is a lot better, and not only in terms of uh, sustainability, but also in terms of animal welfare, right? I mean, they just, a cricket is not the same as a cow. It's just not. So he is right what he says here, but it's not, the way that it's presented is just like, yeah, 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 I'm sure, of course, we can compromise. But he's not actually trying to. <laughs> He's not actually trying to do anything different. And everything else in the video suggests that, no, 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 we don't actually have to do anything. It's fine. Just continue eating beef. It's fine. It's better than going vegan. It just comes across very phony. It's what these, a lot of these people do, right? A lot of people who are obviously on the right, but they like to pretend that they are centrist as if that isn't an actual position, right? But whatever, they like to pretend that they don't have any actual positions. Their position is just the truth, capital T. It is, no. Has that ever been the case ever in the history of humanity? Point is, Crowder is not in the middle. He's not on the fence. He very clearly has picked a side. The freaking video is called Exposed. Veganism is worse for the planet. He's picked a side. And it's the wrong one. History will remember this bitch. In conclusion, eating less animal products is an uncontroversial part of stymieing climate change. I know that it's really popular right now to go after corporations, and I'm all for it, but not at the expense of personal change. Not because I want people to feel guilty, but because it is absolutely necessary in this fight, right? If we care about the future of humanity. You know, we say fight climate change as if it's a, a battle that we can actually win, but that's not true. It's not a video game. It's more like exercise. You don't lift weights until you reach your goal and then stop, right? You have to keep lifting. You have to keep working to keep those gains. We don't meet the goals of the Paris Agreement and then stop. We don't make corporations pollute less and then that's it. We won. Climate change over. We have to continue to waste less, continue to pollute less. All of us, 
forever, right? Or at least until we find another planet to ruin, I guess. Right now, instead of claiming that their dogmatic diet is better for you, which is what we saw with vegetarians in the 60s and yeah. 70s, they are now playing the same misleading angle on the American public by trying to convince them to take this diet up. Not because it's better for you, but because it's better for the planet. Well, guess what? Ah. We found out that it wasn't necessarily better for you, and we now know that it is very less likely worse for the planet. Very less likely worse. Very less likely worse. Oh, yeah. Hey, <laughs> we agree. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe. That's cool. Support the channel. Patreon.com slash Unnatural Vegan. And I will have a new video hopefully soon. A lot of you guys wanted me to do uh, to talk about family vlogging. So I think I will do that next. And then I don't know. From there, we'll just we'll just see. We'll just just wait and see. Are we prepared me. to deal with the health and environmental consequences of maintaining current levels he's definitely of reading red something. meat and yes. dairy products? Yeah, he's reading a script. I don't, I don't get that at all. This is something I see a lot with these kind of people and these kind of debate me dude, you know, debate me bro, debate me dudes. Um, this almost hatred of preparation of reading notes or having a teleprompter, reading a script, whatever. Uh, yeah, I don't understand it. I think, I think they think that it means someone's dumb, <laughs> that they can't just speak perfectly and have all of the information like in their heads. I don't know. It's very weird to me. I mean, all it's doing, whether they know it or not, is encouraging more of this, you know, winning attitude and like you win a debate by being the best debater, not necessarily being right. Right? <laughs> because someone can be very, very bad at debating, but still be right on an issue and still have all of the correct information. So yeah, I don't know. I've seen it a few times now. I've seen critiques of like other YouTubers because they were obviously reading something. I mean, F me, dude. I got notes. I got so many notes. I have everything written out for this video. I don't do that for every video. Sometimes I just have literal like bullet points, but I have like full on sentences for this shit. Um, yeah, you know, I'm not good. Just th listen to me right now. I'm not good just talking. I'm just not. I don't talk particularly fast unless I'm really angry and animated but typically I'm I'm kind of a, a slow thinker that's just how I am does it mean I'm wrong on a particular issue no I don't think so it just means unfortunately yeah I'm probably pretty bad at debating I don't know if I've ever really I mean I've never done any sort of formal debate I mean my friends always thought I was good at arguing but that's just because I spoke very confidently when I was younger and I was like you know the definition of a bitch so I could easily win an argument because I would just keep saying the same thing over and over again and like beat you down until you agree with me but I've grown up since then I'm no longer I mean sometimes I'm that person but I try not to be that person and I'm much less confident in the things many of the things that I believe than when I was 16 and I thought I knew everything right just what a what a horrible age I do not look forward to my kids being 16 I will take a two-year-old over a 16-year-old any day. Point is, I don't get the hatred for scripting stuff. I think it's fine. If anything, I think it means you prepared ahead of time. Awesome. It means you care. It means you care about whoever you're speaking to, whether it's de a debate or you care about the video you made. You know, this took hours and hours of work. If I wanted to, I could have just sat down in front of my computer and set up my camera and just watched the video or just watch it right here on my effing phone. And I could make some shitty ass video where I'm just rambling the whole time and you guys would watch it and I'd make money off of it. But I'm not an asshole and I'm not, I don't know, I care about the stuff that I put out into the world. This isn't, I'm not like, I'm not going after anyone specifically here. I'm sure that there are people who can do that, who are just so you know, quick on their feet and just so incredibly smart that they can do that and still make a good video. And on certain topics, I'm sure that I could. But on something like this, you know, I don't I need to research stuff. I can't just comment on every single source that he puts up there if I don't know what it is. And I don't know exactly what it says. I think my camera died somewhere in the middle of that. But point is preparation is good. Anyone who says otherwise is more concerned about winning 
than they are about knowledge or the truth. 